Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will include Eagle Eggs, Stretchy Pants, and perhaps the greatest film about Catholicism ever made, as we explore the 2006 Jared Hess film, Nacho Libre, here on Created Things. Hola, and welcome to Created Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives and the only arts podcast hosted by two guys who who might seem on first glance to be both sophomoric and sacrilegious, but upon further reflection are really quite profound. I'm artist and psychotherapist Jacob Flores Bobjek. With me is my good buddy, Father Gabriel Toretta. How are you doing today, Father? Um, I was fine until you proposed sophomoric and sacrilegious as being opposed to being profound, which I just feel like just destroyed my whole vibe. Well, I don't, I don't think they are opposed. I just think it's on a deeper level. I think uh, not unlike Shrek, we are like onions and you peel back a layer and then discover oh, underneath. Man, remember, the- remember when Shrek was good? Like Shrek one was like a revelation to me. Like this, it was so good. I like freaked out. I just, I mean, like the rest of, like the rest of America, I thought this movie is the funniest thing that has ever been made with like computer animation. And then all the other Shreks were just like a horrifying disaster. Um, I think I was the only person who really liked Shrek four. Like I don't Wait, like Shrek, Shrek two or four. Three, Stop but it. Shrek four was like actually very kind of dark and haunting in kind of a fun way. I don't Is know. It, it like, was better than I expected it to be. But <laughs> Shrek one colon gritty reboot. It's a it's a it's a wonderful life with Shrek. That's literally what it is. Oh, that. But instead I'm of taking word for it, that does not seem interesting. Okay, yeah, that so. does not seem interesting. But I will take your word for it's it. It's not great, but it's better <laughs> than the others. Fair, fair enough. It's definitely better than the others. Although Shrek is really having a moment. I mean, it's 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 being memed out the out the wazoo. It's kind of like the the memefied thing. Have you heard of Shrek Fest? No. So Shrek Fest is like <laughs> what a music festival is, but it's just Shrek and people gather in a forest. And they all dress up as Shrek, which mostly means like walking around half naked, painted green. Okay. And then they have little Shrek events and panels and it's all very ironic. It's like an ironic comic con, but the thing, the main uh, focus of it is they re I think they do it anew every year, I believe, but it's called Shrek reanimated and like, Every like tons and I can't even count the number tons and tons and tons of animators get to volunteer to produce seven seconds of the movie. Oh my gosh. Own animation style. Okay. That's actually pretty cool. Everyone gets together and watches the whole of it with all those seven second segments cut together. And they have a live like watch party at Shrek fest. And some people will have done claymation <laughs> and some people will have done like insane anime styles, but it only lasts seven seconds. And then you're on to the next style and it's just insane. Yeah. I that watched, sounds uh, like a recipe for epilepsy, but also fun. It is definitely a recipe for epilepsy, which is actually a good name for a band kind of thing. That, but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely, I, I watched Shrek reanimated on YouTube last year like that last year's version and it was really really hard to watch <laughs> and i i kind of want to go to the event it's sort of like shrek burning man i think that's a good way to put it yeah that that sounds yeah it sounds like that yeah sort of yeah shrek bur- like burning man mixed with like larping in the forest which is where yeah. best lor- larping occurs anyway um half clothed which is what i would expect from larping some part of your body painted all this is on brand actually. So yeah, just add in burning man and there you go. Yeah, totally. Totally. It all, it all pretty much fits. Speaking of crass, uh, sort of fart based humor movies from the early nineties, um, or not the early nineties, the early two thousands, excuse me, which really the early two thousands, let's be, let's be honest, are just an extension of the nineties. Like the nineties didn't end until 2005. Um, Mm. but, Speaking of that, our topic today is a topic I've been very excited for for a very long time. Um, It's a topic that I (laughs) have just been excited to discuss with you in general outside of this show. It was a long-term goal to get you to watch uh, a certain movie with me, and that is a movie I have a long and nuanced relationship with, uh, a movie which I unironically argue 
is one of the greatest Catholic films, or at least one of the greatest films about Catholicism and the Catholic experience and the weirdness and uniqueness of what it means to be a Catholic for better and for worse, uh, ever made, ever made. And that film, uh, the topic of today's, uh, today's discussion is, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Nacho Libre. Nacho Libre! <laughs> Um, I can vouch for this that uh, some of the very first times, I, the very first conversation I remember having with Jacob, um, he was telling me about um, the uh, about a a Broadway play. Um, who was it? History just got all sexy pants. What, what was this? Oh, oh, bloody bloody Andrew Jackson. Jeez, that's, that's the a one. throwback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bloody yeah. bloody Andrew Jackson. Uh, which that's thought, a great so so for anyone sidebar anyone listening if you want a really bad great musical check out bloody bloody andrew jackson history just got all sexy pants it is a precursor to hamilton hamilton absolutely ripped it off i will never not argue that and it is a story it is a uh, acdc inspired retelling of the life of america's hitler so which you know it's, it's, everyone out. everyone can get behind that you know i just think this, yeah. is, this is like fun for the whole family um <laughs> yeah so that was the very first conversation i remember having with jacob but like probably the next several dozen conversations i remember having with jacob uh involved him telling me about nacho libre quoting nacho libre saying very funny things from nacho libre um analyzing nacho libre uh my friends i only finally watched nacho libre with jacob which was great uh something like seven years later which is good yeah, yeah we watched it about one month ago yeah um and I've been waiting to do an episode since then. I thought this would be a good time to do it because you don't want to do it too fresh because, you know, you want time to kind of put your thoughts together when you watch a magnum opus of this magnitude. It's true. Um, I mean, there's so much opus there. There's so much. But you don't want magnum so much there. magnum. <laughs> but, you, but you don't also want to wait, you know, years because then, you know, the uh, the time fades, the, the beauty of memory. Um, I want to start off with talking about. So. I didn't always, we should, we should, I get actually, we should start here for the, the poor, sad listener who has perhaps not seen this film. Um, you want to summarize it for them, Father Gabriel, you want to give them the gist of yes. this movie? Yes, I do. In fact, so everyone close your eyes. I said, close your eyes. It's 2006. Jack Black is at the height of his career. He had that band in the early 2000s. It was really big. It stopped being big. But after it stopped being really big, then he was making movies like School of Rock, which as far as I know, doesn't have a plot. Um, he was very <laughs> popular. Uh, Napoleon Dynamite had just come out in... Um, 2004 2005 um 2005 actually and uh i uh, directed by jared hess which was this unbelievable breakout movie we'll talk about that later um that was not supposed to be a big deal but was a gigantic deal um and uh and then a year later um some clever types said like what if we put together this guy who's like fat and screaming hot right now jack black uh, and then this director who's like skinny and also screaming hot right now, uh, Jared Hess, um, and put them together and had them do something. And in fact, this is what happened. It turned into Nacho Libre. Uh, the plot it's not unlike how this podcast was founded, which was let's take this fat guy who's hot right now jacob and hot put him guy. with this skinny guy who's hot right now, so hot right now. <laughs> uh yeah that's i mean this is this is pretty much how i how i imagine myself yes um and uh except for during covid when i was also that guy who was hot right now um, well that was all of us but that was but that was everybody um yeah so the plot of it um makes perfect sense when you first hear it um Jack Black is playing his kind of standard character, which is uh, a Mexican Franciscan priest slash not priest, um, which he's played in every movie. That's that was probably what he played in School of Rock, but nobody's ever seen typecast, it. So it really really, matter. Yeah. Typecast, really. Yeah. Um, I, he never sings the greatest song in the world in the whole movie. I'm just gonna tell you right now. Spoiler alert. That's the only sad part. Um, anyway, um, 
So he works for an orphanage um, slash the Franciscans he's with run an orphanage. Um, he is the cook. He cannot cook well for his orphans because he does not have any money. Uh, then he decides that to like provide for the needs of the orphans and to be able to cook for them well, uh, he is going to become a uh, lucha li- uh, luchador. So a lucha libre uh, Mexican wrestler wearing a mask. Uh, a fulfillment of his sort of lifelong true dream. Right. right. Because he... Because it turns out he's a little bit of a schlep uh, as a Franciscan priest slash not priest. The movie is profoundly unclear about this question. Um, and uh, and so he always secretly really wanted to be a luchador, but uh, but people say that to be a luchador is to sin, and so he does not want to. Um, this goes very well. Uh, he succeeds immensely after... Uh, with with struggles and failures uh, along the way, just like you would hope. Um, along the way, um, there appears this marvelous woman uh, whose name is Sister Encarnacion of the Visitation of the Holy Tree of the Sacred <laughs> Cross. Anyway, it's amazing. This is a scene where, she, where her order is, is introduced uh, and just, it just keeps rattling off all these genitive clauses for like a thousand years and nobody can follow it. Um, anyway, she is your... Um, she is what you'd expect, which is she is sexy nun who appears among the Franciscans. Um, and everyone thinks that she is sexy nun and wants to monopolize her time. Um, yeah, let's and be clear. A, she She herself is seen as sexy, but she's not played as sexy. She's just like a nice normal girl who everyone is sort of putting their, their sexiness upon because she is in fact a sexy lady, but she is, but she is marvelously acting as a reasonably demure nun the entire time. Uh, as if she does not understand that everyone is, uh, their tongues are hanging out because she is sexy nun. Um, part of this then becomes the Jack black priest, not priest character decides to, um, woo kind of, sexy nun uh by his uh with the proceeds from being a luchador because he doesn't really want to admit to her that he is one such um things go along there is a because she doesn't want she thinks that being a luchador is evil uh there are there are various crises um there's a final final showdown uh with his where he meets the big boss uh in the luchador ring and Sister Encarnacion brings all the orphans to be there with him, uh, and he triumphs, and everyone triumphs, uh, and then, like, it kind of seems like um, Sister Encarnacion and uh, Jack Black's character are going to, like, run away f- run away from their uh, religious orders and their religious vows, um, which Jack Black's character has been kind of trying to do for a little while, um, and instead, they, like, stand facing the sunset, like, talking about god and helping the orphans and being in their religious orders and the scene ends and the movie is over and there's nothing really quite like it for the ending of a film yeah i mean it's super dissatisfying from a purely hollywood perspective and for a movie produced by nickelodeon of all oh, places yes, of, yes. all, of all yeah, companies yeah, yeah. uh it is it feels like a like the way an indie art film would end like that very much sort of the uh john mulaney and nick kroll and their broadway show uh oh hello which just picks on like artsy plays have this amazing <laughs> bit where they talk about how all artsy plays end with a line that makes no sense and is extremely mundane and then just fade to black and and they do it in their play they just end the play by saying i'll have two root beers man and then just the whole show just darkens <laughs> and there was no context for it and that was that's very much the ending of this where you expect a very kind of tight like well yes of course the priest leaves his vows because celibacy would be terrible and you know all this these kinds of things that you expect from a hollywood film and, and instead it it ends in this very kind of beautiful slightly uncertain uh you know kind of indie film note which is weird when you're a kid watching a nickelodeon film where all the jokes are farts yeah well also not all the jokes are farts a significant portion of the jokes come from the fact that jack jack black um speaks in the most outrageous mexican accent the entire time It's amazing that it hasn't been canceled. Uh, it really is. I, I'm worried that just by saying it out into the air, we're going to alert whatever evil spirit is in charge of that. And so we're like, oh, yeah, we missed one. How on earth? Yeah. I mean, it would be a little tough to cancel Jack Black. Like, what are you going to do? Well, 
we don't don't even say it don't yeah. even jinx it that way man you know what, what you're heck? right you're not you're right it's i'm not gonna come treasure. up with reasons you could you could jinx but you could uh you could cancel jack black but um you know most of the songs that he did in his band probably would do that perfectly fine in fact um now that i think <laughs> about it so um yeah uh but yes that is <clears throat> there's another part of this film is that um so it's filmed in mexico and um almost all of the actors uh are like local mexican actors um it's mostly filmed in waka i think um mm-hmm. i think a lot of the actors are from mexico city but but it's filmed uh mostly in location in waka um there <clears throat> i i was i was dismayed to find out that there's these two these two main orphan characters they are from la but basically everybody else except for Jack Black um are are Mexican actors which is cool and and like I said it's filmed in Waka so um it gives you this um so the whole th- the whole time there is honestly this almost magical realist feel about the whole thing that you have all of these obviously local Mexican actors talking as straight men often to Jack Black, who is a fat white dude from America talking in an outrageous Mexican accent. Uh, and the fact that like no one ever averts to this in the film at all, and it is in no way problematized, in no way discussed, like it's one of the genius aspects of the film in point of fact. It's like you realize from the first scene when like, he has this accent and no one comments on it that like this film is not going to apologize for itself. Like it's not going to stop. It's not going to, it's not going to rethink its premises. It's not going to be like awkward uh, and shrinking about what it does. It's just going like really, really hard Um, in a way that like, as the, all, as all the drama goes on actually does really bear some like, mind feel similarity with reading like a magical realist novel Mm -hmm. where you're just like okay this is something that you are going to ask me to expect uh to accept and um yeah we just move on like that yeah no it does it does sort of make you say all right you know i'm just i'm just committing to the the sort of suspended disbelief of this and and then i find that so I look, I, I need to to kind of give my own background with this because so when I first watched this as a young kid who was no fun and deeply scrupulous and didn't understand what nuance was, I was predictably offended by this movie. So I was I was deeply offended by this movie. I did not like it. Um and was especially offended because I knew a little bit about the fact that this was based on the life and career of a real Catholic priest in Mexico who ran real, not just one, but plural orphanages. Um, mm. The the father Sergio Guterres Benitez. Um, and I knew a little bit about him and that he had actually raised money for um, his orphanages by working as a, as a luchador secretly um, for some time. Um, I didn't know a lot about him, but I knew a little bit and I was just super offended by the, the cliche and it is a cliche of the priest who's like attracted to the nun and, and all this stuff. And I, I just sort of shut down at that point. Um, and then years later, um, and I don't, I don't know if this is talking at a school or not. If you're listening, I apologize, Christopher, but years later when I became, um, friends with Christopher West and when, when he sort of took me under his wing theologically, um, in college, I guess I was staying at his house and he took me to my first Byzantine mass. Oh yeah. I had never been to a Byzantine mass before, which now Chris West lives in Amish country. He lives in, um, like rural Amish country of Pennsylvania. Um, just outside of intercourse PA, ironically. Mm, that, and, wow. That uh, does say a lot about, what happened with his life yes mm-hmm. yes we're, yeah, going, exactly. we're going on christopher west of course if you guys don't know teaches a lot about catholic sexuality this is like his whole thing he speaks on it all over the world anyway so i'm driving with him an hour through amish country uh to my first byzantine mass 
and he decides to play on a loop like five times the soundtrack for Nacho Libre. Well, wow, that's um, a yeah, that's a odd choice. Yeah. Because he tells me that this is the best movie about uh Catholic uh experience and desire he's ever seen. Yeah, but it's and a this soundtrack. shocked me. Well, yes, but he he just wanted to jam to it. So he's just like singing all the lyrics to Jack Black's insane songs for like you know, the hour that it takes to get his Byzantine mass. That's amazing. Which, uh, again, the most surreal experience I've ever had. <laughs> Just watching Amish people pass as I go to a Byzantine mass, listening to the Nacho Libre soundtrack. A lot of different cultures colliding there. Um, and that began me wanting to kind of open myself up to, okay, maybe there's something in this movie I'm missing. Maybe I was a little bit too cynical. Um, Cause I was in my whole kind of deconstruction phase anyway, spiritually. And so I started revisiting the film and it has totally not ironically, it has, it has been something I've revisited many, many times over the course of my adult life. And as silly as it is to say, I mean, it's not Citizen Kane or something, but as silly as it is to say, every single time I watch it, I kind of have a new spiritual takeaway from it. I learn something new from it. And I'm never quite sure if that was intended by the filmmakers or not. Um, I've also learned more about the actual priest upon whom it was based. And it's a lot more similar than I initially gave it credit for. So uh, amazing. Dude's crazy. So father Sergio was just to give a little background is, I mean, he's still alive, I believe Oh uh, wow. in his late seventies now, but uh, there's actually been two movies made about him. Nacho Libre was the second one. The first was a French film called the man in the golden mask. Huh. Um, and both movies, he only gave permission for his story to be used so that they would give him a huge sum of money for him to build yet another orphanage with. Oh, wow. Um, he had built an orphanage after the man in the golden mask was made in the early nineties. And then one of his orphans actually accidentally burned it down. <laughs> so mm, then he likes to do that. Right. Yeah. Famously. And they, um, so then he licensed Nacho Libre and, and built it again, but he's a pretty crazy story. Um, he was like, I'm forgetting the exact number, but he was born like the youngest of 14 kids. So his parents just gave him up cause like they couldn't support 14 kids. He was raised in a Catholic orphanage, felt super conflicted about the existence of God, but loved Catholicism and ended up becoming a priest, but was super reluctant about it still. Mm. And um, mm -hmm. was assigned as an assistant pastor to an extremely, extremely um, crime ridden parish that was exclusively populated by drug dealers and prostitutes he says just exclusively populated by drug dealers and prostitutes and was only a cultural parish in like the most war-torn area of veracruz and um he was assigned to just kind of walk around the church every day and pray a rosary and while he was inside one day he came out and found that a couple of prostitutes and like two drug dealers had filled his car up to the brim with sand <laughs> Which yeah. I wish had ended up in the movie, but they had done it because they were like, you got to get out of town. We don't want you here. And he was That's like, well, I'm, I'm staying here. And they challenged him to a fight. And they, he said, and they said, if you, if you fight us, we'll let you stay. So he agreed and he got his ass beaten to a pulp. Yeah. But won the respect of the community. What? And this prompted his like starting to kind of adopt this community and find his faith through serving this community. And ultimately there were a lot of orphanage like him who he wanted to be able to take care of. Um, he ended up continuing to learn to fight after this becomes a luchador purely in secret goes by the name of Frey Tormenta, which is Friar storm. And he, um, gets like quite a lot of notoriety, uh, for himself, uh, to the degree that the diocese starts investigating because they think that this Frey Tormenta character is like parodying Catholicism and they want this to stop. So they're calling everybody and trying to figure out who knows who this guy is. Cause of course, uh, for those who don't know, when you are a luchador, you wear your mask all the time, like a superhero, your identity is secret. And this is a very important part of the whole thing, right? Yeah. To and this so, literal, I'm going to interrupt you to this astonishing degree that, um, uh, 
apparently one of the i'm blanking on his name right now but one of the most famous uh luchadors from uh you know the latter half of the 20th century like was literally buried in his mask yeah yeah like totally buried in his mask uh a, n- a number of the luchadors um in the in the movie are actual luchadors and uh and the director said uh it's really interesting he said that when he was doing the casting um that like at one point like early on when he was doing the casting he was he was talking to like younger new like newer luchadors and uh he'd ask them like well like let me see your face so they come into the interview they come into the casting thing with it wearing their mask and stuff and ready to show him their moves but then he'd say like well i need to see what you look like you know whatever whatever and the younger guys are this they take their mask off and be like hey it's me you know uh but when he got to like the more experienced guys uh he's he has this like funny anecdote that he asked this more experienced uh luchador to say like okay well you seem like you're great like let me see your face like take off your mask let me see your face uh and the guy like just went like ice cold and was like absolutely not yeah you realize like Okay, I have been doing something very bad, and I will never do it again. So, yeah. Yeah. I did not study up on my cultural competency. Anyway, so yeah, everyone's trying to figure out who is the secret identity of this Frey Tormenta, and the bishop ends up calling um, Father Sergio and says, do you know who this is? And he's like, yeah, it's me. Now, um, hi. <laughs> and the bishop's like, you cannot do this anymore. This is unbecoming of a priest to do this. This is undignified. And Sergio says... Uh, sure, that's totally fine. I'll quit and I'll just come by the bishop's office or your your office uh, every month to pick up the same amount of money uh, for the orphanage. And there's just like, according to his telling of the story, there's just this long pause. The bishop's like, fine, you can continue doing it. Huh? <laughs> um, and yeah, he funded it and he's put, he's put so, he's helped so many kids. I mean, it's insane. Like a huge percentage I, i'm forgetting the exact percentage but a huge percentage of the kids from his orphanages have gone on to college there have been lawyers there have been doctors um there have been several priests and religious who have come out of his orphanages um and one kid specifically ended up taking on his mantle of Frey tormenta when he finally retired and passed his mask on mm. um so he he's made a hell of a difference in a number of kids lives he would i think um uh, uh, arrest some some of our perhaps more conservative or traditional listeners. Uh, he has definitely, you know, per what you were saying with the seriousness of the mask, he has definitely said mass in his mask. Oh my gosh. Like a lot, I think. I suspect a lot. Um, he uh, he wears a rubber band on his finger. And mm-hmm. I believe it's on his finger at all times. And he says, as long as I have been a priest, I have always worn a rubber band because the church and her teaching is like a rubber band. She must always be stretching. But if you stretch it too much, it will break. Uh. And part of me loves that. So anyway, he's a very uh, unorthodox figure, but it was this figure that inspires this insane movie. Um, with Jack Black that has become this this big inspiration to me. So I'm just curious, you know, we watched this a month ago. I got some of your initial thoughts like right after watching it. But having a month under your belt, like what what did you think of this movie? This is kind of our first episode where we're just reviewing a very specific piece of art. Um, and I'm just curious like what some of your your experiential takes of it are. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, it is it is really hilarious. Like just watching it is a blast. Um, especially I'm, you know, uh, sort of madly, madly, madly in love with uh, Napoleon Dynamite. And there, this is I think this is his second film. So it's the film he makes it's just right after Napoleon Dynamite was was really big. Um, so a lot of his kind of story, like has his storytelling te- techniques uh are very similar to napoleon dynamite because basically he hasn't like totally learned different storytelling techniques yet um and uh and so that's really like that's really fun it's really interesting um one of the things about that is that like you know napoleon dynamite has this very disjointed feel where like almost it's almost like every scene many of the scenes seem to be just like individual set pieces that don't entirely relate to the plot except insofar as they're just more about the characters like in the characters world and that's part of the movie's genesis is kind of like a a film that he made when he was when he was in film school and like and like things that he was doing when he was he was he went to byu he grew up in uh uh 
parts of Mormon Utah, went to went, went to BYU, all this stuff. Uh, and so he did these kind of like sketchy things that then turned much of which turned into there was kind of an earlier iteration of it that he sort of redid into what became Napoleon Dynamite. So some of that storytelling technique is also found in Nacho Libre, where like it, not every scene, strictly speaking, makes sense in the story. It's just that it's like you could just there. end with. Not every Strictly scene speaking, makes sense. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah, actually, that's entirely <laughs> true. Um, and some characters show up that who seem seem like they're not going to stick around, uh, and then they just do stick around. And uh, yeah, so it's it feels very random. Um, but that randomness, I don't know. Like uh, these are actually the only. Even though I really like Hess, these are actually the only two films of his I've seen, uh, and mm. I would kind of like to see what his more mature stuff is like because um, that randomness was just a very strong narrative device that he knew how to work really, really well. So it does feel like it's a a single person's vision, which is something I always really appreciate in a movie. I know every movie can't be this, and especially big studio tentpole films, you you can't tell who did what on them because there's so many cooks in the kitchen. But in much the same way that like a Wes Anderson film feels like a Wes Anderson film or a Spielberg film feels like a Spielberg film, this this feels like it is constantly in the hands of a very specific vision and if you like the vision great and if you don't like the vision great but but you know there is one artist working on it and jack black talks about this that he loved working with Hess because he broke all the rules of a director that Hess would like come in and show him exactly what to do with the acting oh and he's like you're not he's like you're not supposed to do that like you're, you're, you're supposed to sort of give the actor inspiration not puppet them and tell them exactly what to do he said but i loved working with him because anything he did was a thought like I would just be rolling laughing because he just had this perfect vision for what this character was supposed to do. And so all of us were just imitating what Hess was acting out and we loved working on it. That's incredible. Yeah. Really cool. Yeah, no, for sure. I think like it's interesting to me. Every, my sense of the film actually was pretty similar to like, um, my sense of, a very very different movie which was um from, from around the same era though uh knocked up oh, um, interesting so like just by comparison to say like you know this is a judd apatow movie it was i don't know his second or third and stuff it's one of these so it was it was when he and seth rogan were making all kinds of mostly sort of crass like bro movies and and that this um uh you know, he had made 40 year old version beforehand, which is just a crass, like garbage movie, um, just kind of whatever, making fun of all kinds of things. And like, not, there's nothing, nothing interesting about that film. Um, does not take its character seriously, does not take human problems seriously, just like whatever characters of characters for their own sake. Um, yeah. Gag driven basically. Yeah. And then like, and then all to promote like a very, like a very, um, they have to be dishonest about how human beings work because it's promoting a very dishonest um, con- like kind of aspect of contemporary society um, and holding it up as good. Um, so right, like they can't right, yeah. tell true stories because they're trying to promote a lie, which is really a problem. <clears throat> Knocked up was totally the opposite where like it's this it's the same guys, like many of the same actors, all this kind of stuff. But like he every place he could have cho- ch- taken cheap tricks, every place he could have just like driven a standard kind of social narrative um he chose to use like to tell a real story and to like dig deep into like characters who were really human um who were doing really fascinating things and what is at some level just a bro comedy about like the consequences of having a one night stand actually is this like really rich film about like coming to be alive from the like half life of pubescence um and it's a prolonged prolonged um, adolescence basically um and it's it's a beautiful film like a profoundly beautiful film and hilarious and all the rest and everything like this um so sometimes you get these movies that like rise very profoundly out of the sort of genre that they seem to be working in and i think i think nacho libre does that um, where it just seems to be this kind of like campy, I mean, it's produced by Nickelodeon. And so you would expect it to be oriented towards kids. P.S. There's not really a single moment where it like 
pauses and is like, hey, kids, let's do stuff that kids like. That literally never happens in the whole film. Um, but anyway, like you would expect it to be just kind of a campy. And again, like you would expect it to be like School of Rock Part 2 or something or like a Tenacious D. That's his that's Jack Black's band uh, or like a Tenacious D like um, promotion vehicle. And it's 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 none of it. Just this. Or, I feel or, like there are moments where you can tell the producers wanted it to be. <clears throat> like there, there are certain gags, like uh, Jack Black's character Ignacio um, has to break into a party being held by luchadors by pretending to be a mariachi, and then the mariachi just like put him forward to oh, improvise right. a song. Yeah, and he that's does one of point. his classics, like do 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 type Jack Black songs, which in the film, like I love it. It's freaking hilarious it does really work but you're right it does also feel like one of those moments where the producer's like jesus can we get some like jack black stuff in there like can he fart a little bit more can he do this a little bit more and and the movie says yes but we're gonna always take it one step deeper like we're gonna make it one step deeper than anybody here wants it to be um and i i always really love that i think that's really cool yeah yeah i mean and this is this is what's so weird about Hess, or at least what Hess was able to do in Napoleon Dynamite and this film, which is that like when Napoleon Dynamite came out, um, it had a lot of flack for um, the way that it worked with not just what you could say, like cultural stereotypes, but like caricatures, you know, mm-hmm. um, really, I, I, there is a black woman character in the film that I genuinely don't think would be made today um just uh she's just pushing some really strong cer- certain really strong stereotypes and all um i part which is consi- visually cons- or cons- uh, worldview consistent in the film um because it's set in preston idaho which is a teeny little town uh and the base of idaho um where there are like not anybody of any minorities and so partly you're seeing like people from the perspective of like I don't actually know what anybody who's not white is like. Um, and oh, the filmmaker sure, yeah. is like in a fairly courageous way, just sort of like presenting that um, with a lot of love, you know, there's nothing weird about it. But um, I, anyway, when, when I first watched that, that movie and was totally obsessed with it, some friends of mine expressed like real concern about like, I just like, these are such caricatures. I don't think this is like a good thing for people to do, to promote that kind of stuff. Um, and so like Napoleon Dynamite's funny because yeah, it is these insane caricatures and you could say these are not real people and they're not supposed to be real people, except that Hess is not interested in just promoting sort of like um, a social narrative about people. Like he has this weird ability to use caricature to unveil a real person. So mm-hmm. like, one of the reasons why Napoleon Dynamite is this major touchstone film for me is because like Napoleon Dynamite, the main character is this over the top caricature of like the mega nerd white boy from like the Pacific Northwest and all of this, um, like not the fashionable part of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and, uh, and you say, well, this is just a kid. So much, so extreme. Like people in small towns are not like that. Well, listen, I'm here to tell you, I went to high school with Napoleon Dynamite. Like the <laughs> first time I saw the movie, I literally, it was the first time in my entire life. I literally had to hold onto my chair because I was falling out of my seat laughing so hard because like I was good friends with this man in high school. And like, and this is what I mean. Like, there's a certain art um, that is extremely difficult um, to like using extreme push again, almost like magical realist level, extreme pushing on the possibilities of human caricature um, to, in fact, tell very profound truths about what it means to be a person. Um, it's almost like like um, painting a portrait using a magnifying glass, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, caricature and stereotype is a tool. And I think it is an absolutely valid artistic critique to say that often, perhaps most often, it is used as a tool for harm. Um, but I think like any tool, it, it can be used by someone who knows how to use it well to reveal great beauty and great truth. I, I um, There's this sort of trend on YouTube. Uh, not that you'd know because you live under a rock. 
but uh, there's a trend on YouTube of experts reacting to uh, movies and movies. Even I know about that. that. Yeah, I, field. Okay, I, I, I tried. I tried watching a couple of these, and they are so insanely boring. I just couldn't. I couldn't do it. Some of them again. I really like. There's a guy who does accents from different parts of the world. He studies oh, that would linguistics, be really fun. and he just reviews different actors even historical accents like he reviewed uh the abraham lincoln movie that uh abraham Steven lincoln Va- vampire slayer no no i wish but he did the uh the just like the lincoln movie that steven spielberg did with um what's his name the method actor i, I don't know i have believe i mean this is true to form i have not seen that movie because i despise steven spielberg but uh i have seen oh, abraham lincoln vampire slayer because it is the best movie ever um, it is one of the best movies ever it's, it's so freaking good movie. yeah anyway we gentlemen. have bad taste in movies i think that's the takeaway you just yeah, said yeah. you hate steven spielberg and that we love Abraham Lincoln. but no he like reviewed that and talk and like compares it to actual like recordings that we have in letters that we have about abraham lincoln's voice and like deconstructed so some of them are really interesting but there was one guy i was watching who's a world war ii historian who was going through all these movies that really really tried to get it exactly right and per your thing about hitting steven spielberg just had nothing but vitriol to spew against saving private ryan yeah it's like, good i, I have of, always like, hated this movie but it was like a sacred cow when it came out like he, he was like he was like any actual world war ii historian hates this movie he was like this is a terrible film this like i'm pointing out all the things that are wrong and then he and then they show him a scene from Jojo Rabbit, ha! which is a scene, a movie about a little kid and his imaginary friend who happens to be Adolf Hitler. Right. And he's like, this is the this is he's like, ironically, this is the best movie about this time period probably ever made. What? He's like, and he said, and you wouldn't think so, but he's because they're not trying to go crazy historical. Because they let you know right up front, we're not trying to take this too seriously. We're not trying to be uber historically accurate. You can actually relax and stop caring about, well, this tank was made in 41, but the scene was set in 42 and stuff, which is all the problems with something like Save a Private Ryan. And he's like, instead, you can just enjoy that this is actually probably the best cinematic depiction of what emotionally it was actually like to be a German during the final days of the war. Oh, wow. and, oh, and that's that awesome. identity crisis and, you know, that longing to be part of something greater and knowing that your identity is being taken away and that maybe they had that identity was, was evil. Um, and, and having to reckon with that. And it was really beautiful what he was talking about. And I, I see Nacho Libre and, and, and Hess's work in general that way. I, I think to me, I don't know if you'd agree. Napoleon dynamite is a film primarily about loneliness and in my mind anyway, and he's using these caricatures to explore loneliness and even the the character of the town and how isolated it is, you know, amidst all the cornfields and the cows and everything to explore the idea of loneliness. And um, and I think Nacho Libre is a film ultimately not just about faith, but about devotion, about spiritual devotion and desire, spiritual desire and these kinds of things. And I think he uses caricature to explore that the same way so i i'm a huge fan of it i want to pause really quickly because i want to get into speaking of the spiritual aspects i want to get into like what some of our our religious takeaways are from it artistically um but i do uh, need to pause and give a little shout out speaking again of the the religion stuff to our sponsor um this podcast mm-hmm. created things is brought to you by catholic creatives and also catholic.store so catholic creatives is an organization dedicated to um promoting the creative spirit among artists all over the world and uh, to do this they connect and support uh, and promote artists and innovators and makers and storytellers from kind of across the faith uh, community but it takes a community to bring big ideas like the like these to life so by supporting our patreon the catholic creatives patreon you not only help this podcast and we do appreciate that help but you also contribute directly to future workshops uh, summits and resources meant to support catholic artists around the country while also getting an inside track on all these activities with access to our member only facebook group so to join uh, we encourage you to visit catholiccreatives.org forward slash support. Uh, and in addition, the beautiful products from Catholic Creatives makers, artisans, and artists can be found at catholic.store. 
Don't give your money to the random Amazon, the uh, the child sweatshop. Don't don't do it. Instead, give your money to uh, some local artist who is putting their blood, sweat, and spirituality into creating something beautiful just for you by going to Catholic dot store today. So, as I was saying, I draw a lot of spiritual truth from this movie. I think I think there. There is a lot of spiritual truth to be drawn. I'm never quite certain how much I'm bringing to it and how much of it is intentional. This is always the problem when Catholics review things. There's this really annoying trend that I I cringe over when any Christian goes, oh my gosh, this film is actually super religious. And oh my gosh, when I watched Iron Man, it was actually like about Jesus actually. Or when I listened to this song by Bono, it's actually about Jesus actually. Um, that really right. annoys me. Yeah. I think we should yeah, be able yeah, yeah. to like things without <clears throat> needing those things to be secretly about Jesus. Um, I think we should be able to say, hey, I drew personal spiritual revelation from this. This gave me insight into my own spirituality without thinking that it was intentional on the part of the filmmakers. That said, I actually don't know. <laughs> I'm never sure how much of these takeaways were intentional part of the filmmakers because they feel so intentional. And I'm just curious to start off with what some of you, your big, especially what some of the most surprising spiritual things you noticed in this film were as, as a priest. Um, yeah, like I think it's, I think the most surprising thing about it is just the way that the film like sets up in every possible way for the kind of standard, just your totally bog standard, like, um, Catholic priest narrative in a film, you know, where like famous actor is Catholic priest. Usually it's handsome actor, but this time it's Jack Black. That was, it was, it was 2006. That was just what people wanted. Um, so, you know. Hey now, in the uh, holiday he is very handsome. So I I will just tell you that. Oh well, there you go. Guess what? I'm not going to watch the holiday. <laughs> <laughs> so there it is. Um, but uh, but I believe you, Jacob. I trust you. I, I'm a Jack Black stan. What can I say? Yeah, there what it is. What can I say? Um, so, uh, yeah. So there's just this totally sad. You normally like handsome Hollywood actor inexplicably playing Catholic priest has no idea what to do about it. You can physically see uh, that he has no idea what he's doing. Um, uh, Literally any woman shows up um, and then suddenly he's like, Oh no, maybe God doesn't exist. Oh no. You know? And then like halfway into the movie, they are making the sweet love. And then at the end of the film, then like um, if it's a happy movie, then they, they've gone off together. And if it's like a sad movie, then like he's made her have an abortion and like killed, she's killed herself. And like, he's a scumbag priest and like, whatever, you know what I mean? Like there's just these totally standard tropes, but this is just how right, that works. Yeah. Um, and they kind of set it up um, uh, in some fun ways. And you sort of, it seems that this is what's happening, but like um, the film just keeps like tripping set setting those alarms and then like tripping them you know and and just sort of like overturning them and flipping them and uh and that like yeah you realize jack black's character um is like at the beginning of the movie he basically has a like a 12 year old's everything he has he like physically acts like a 12 year old he sort of like is scribbling scribbling in his notebook uh at um in church uh he's it's not really clear what he's doing in church but in any case um like he's like scribbling his notebook in his in, in church and like looking out the window like the like the orphan kids are um he talks like a child acts like a child dresses like a child like all the just everything you know and then like when he meets uh sister sexy nun sister Encarnacion, uh his reaction to her is kind of like a 12 or 13 year old boy sort of like reaction to like sexy lady who walks in the door and so you think like okay there it is it's just like well that's it's just a very obvious setup for this very obvious thing um and then the film never goes there it never goes there like i think one one plot arc one dynamic that's happening in the maybe not plot arc but one dynamic that's happening in the film um that i found to be like really there was just not at all what I expected a film like this to be doing um, is that you are watching 
in every sense the maturation of this person um that he starts out as a like a 12 or 13 year old in a in a big boy's body um and by the end of the film he has actually had to like be an adult and like come to terms with being an adult and like how some of the conditions in which he finds himself are in fact like they he may have made those decisions when he was not yet an adult interiorly but that but they are his life and they are going to be his life you know um so it's this richly like um it is a real tale of human maturation just from his perspective like um religiously psychologically i mean even sexually frankly because that's part of the film um is the way that it it never actually devolves into just like adolescent fantasy i mean there is adolescent fantasy but it's never realized it is always right, forced yeah. to become something more mature mm -hmm. um and uh and so in the end you have you have a real human in with this very character like Mexican accent and this Jack Black and it's all hilarious, but you have a real human at the end, like a real man at the end of the film. Um, and like it is in the most un Joseph Campbell on hero's journey way possible. So like, and I think that's part of what makes the film so fresh and like makes it storytelling. So real um, is that if it was, for instance, um, if it was made, produced by Disney after the mid 1980s, when um, an important Disney executive circ uh, circ circulated uh, like an eight point memo um, version of um, uh, Joseph Campbell's <laughs> uh, Hero's Journey uh, and instructed all writers from that point forward to use it as the basic framework for literally every story they would ever tell again, which, by oh. the way, has never been recanted and they still do. Um, so right, you think, yeah. wow, these Disney movies just seem kind of formulaic, fun, effective, like a really effective formula. But man, what a formula. That's because there literally is a formula. It's a memo. You can find it on the internet. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just um, the hero's journey gone wild, you know? Um, and the fact that Hess totally refuses any kind of cheapening of reality, like the hero's journey, um, means that he actually has to like engage with serious things like how does a man who is a boy inside come to terms with the crises that 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 provokes there's a lot of talk in um in feminist theory about the male gaze in art and how a lot of art is made from the perspective of the male gaze and that when women make art depicting women it is it, it it at least is arguably that they they are able to do so with more nuance and with themes that are more relatable to the specific women as opposed to when, when a man does it and in theory does so from this very kind of outsider's perspective and you know there are lots of people who debate that but i think this idea of of an outsider's gaze is really important when we talk about different minority communities right that um, so often those communities are only depicted by people from outside of those communities. You see this, um, with, uh, representations of native Americans, right? Uh, you know, when native Americans actually are able to make their own films, um, and are given, you know, the privilege to do so, those films look very, very different than the many, many films made by white people about native Americans. And the same thing is true of about Catholics, right? About real actual people of faith. Um, and, uh, from an outsider's perspective, from the sort of uh, secular gaze, if you will, the most interesting thing about the priesthood is the celibacy, right? right. And this is yeah. ultimately why these movies about priests always include this very tired trope that you already described. But from an insider's perspective, from the Catholic gaze, the most interesting thing about priesthood is the paternity is the yeah, fatherhood yeah, component. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. and what I want to say to kind of piggyback on what you're talking about is I don't think it's just him maturing as an adult. It's him embracing um, not just priesthood, but fatherhood, right? Yeah. And, and there's, I think, the shame of the character is so tightly associated with a feeling of fraud that he wants to be a real wrestler but isn't taken seriously. He actually does want to be a real priest, but isn't taken seriously. In other words, he's looking for 
father figures to give him this approval that he's searching for. He's looking for the approval of Ramses, this great wrestler, and he's looking for the approval of the other priests, right? There's this really funny, funny line, but I think it has a lot of pathos where he says, uh, the uh, sister Encarnacion is asking him uh, what it's what it's like living at the monastery. And he says, the orphans, they are the best, but the brothers, they think I don't know a buttload of crap about the gospel, but I do. And and he the just it's so funny. And to the degree that I'm actually wearing a t-shirt that says they think I don't know a buttload of crap about the gospel, but I do. Uh which, which, which is by the way, the best line and the best shirt ever. Yes. Yes, it's best line, best shirt. I made the shirt uh because it pers- p- perfectly encapsulates my one year of hell working for uh, a Catholic radio show. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> um it is it is a really beautiful line about like what it's like to be not taken seriously by people of faith and and specifically by the father figures that you're surrounded by and his frustration about that. And then as the film goes on, you see him step into the role of fatherhood first by thinking that he needs a wife to do that. Right. right. Like, like it's not explicitly said, but it's, he has this very sophomoric idea of like, Oh, to become what I want to become. I need this woman to sort of give me my vocation, um, but ends up graduating from that, that idea spiritually and, and just becoming a father to the orphans there and, and really, really embracing his, his priesthood and embracing not in the Hollywood sense, like who he truly is. Right. But in like a deep um, incarnational sense, who he truly is that I think the, the thing that occurred to me most, the last time I watched it, there were two things, but one of them, the last time I watched it with, with you, um, was that the, the final scene in the movie, he runs out and he's wearing this bizarre, you want to talk about magical realism, right? He's wearing this bizarre outfit that's a combination of his monastic robes and his wrestler's uh, tracksuit. And this is what he's wearing now. And if you take the movie seriously, you have no idea why he's wearing this. But if you're seeing this movie through the magical realism gaze, you realize that this, this is a movie about this theme that Father Gabriel and I have talked about so often on this podcast, the, the idea of the, the fundamentally and uniquely Catholic idea of incarnation, the idea that the spiritual and the physical are not separate, that, that the, the spiritual world is not the true one and the physical world is just trash that we have to throw away, as many religions would say, as some scrupulous Christians would say. It's also not that the physical world is all that there is and the spiritual world is just fluffy made up bullshit. It's that they are kind of one of the same and, and actually the Christian life is trying to reintegrate them because evil and sin and our, and our tendency to hurt one another uh, threatens to separate those two realities. And and it is the job of the Christian, indeed the job of the human, to to reintegrate their spirituality and their physicality together into one thing. And this is is the thing Ignacio is, pun intended, actually wrestling with the entire film. He is wrestling with his, his physicality represented by his desire to wrestle and his spirituality represented by his sincere desire to actually be a priest. It's not that he, he is a priest who secretly wants to be a luchador and they're at odds. He really wants to be both and just cannot figure out how to do it. And ends up by the end, fully integrating those parts of himself into a full father to these orphans as represented by this absolutely ridiculous looking outfit. And per that point, this is one of those many things that I'm not sure wasn't intended right. by the filmmaker because when you're making a stereotypical Catholic movie, what do you name your nun? You, mar- you name her Sister Mary Rose, Sister Mary Agnes. If it's set in Mexico, it's you know Maria Magdalena. You know, it's it's Sister it's always, Maria Maria, <laughs> right? Sister Maria Maria, which would have been funny, right? I mean, like that's what you go for. They go for the name that no secular filmmaker would ever go for, Sister Incarnacion. Sister incarnation. This is a story about incarnation of integrating the physical and the spiritual into the single united Christian father. And I, yeah, man, I, I just can't help. I I know it feels like I, I always feel like I sound like I'm wearing a tinfoil hat, but 
that feels like a super intentional choice on the part of the filmmakers. And it's, I think the incarnational component is why I was so attractive to Christopher West and that it's why it has stuck with me so much ever since. Yeah, I know that like, if I, if either of us ever get a chance to talk to, to Hess one day, um, it would be really great to ask him to just talk a little bit about this film because, um, you know, when we were watching it together, we noticed like, um, that there's another thing in the film that's like very hard to say if it's intentional or just literally random, but like, um, it, during the whole, like for almost all of the movie, every time you see Jack Black make the sign of the cross, he does it wrong. Um, like he's, I think mostly he's using his left hand. Um, or he does it, yeah, he does it with his left he, hand, and he often or does he does it, does it the reverse, opposite way, right? Or yeah, he's like, yeah. you know, the um, which are, but, and again, like when I saw that, I just thought, like, okay, well, this is this is totally that's such inside baseball stuff. Like, I mean, at least they're having him wear like a real a real kind of habit. Like, uh, that's fine. Like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fuss. But I, I noticed obviously because like this is my life that he was like doing this wrong, you know. And, and again, I, like, I just want to pause because again, we do have listeners from all over different faith traditions. And I know this is a very inside baseball Catholic kind of episode. But like, again, this is why I took took it to kind of the idea of like how women are represented in media, how Native Americans are represented in media. It is actually important when you're depicting a community to depict that community on their own terms. And like, this is something that frustrates Catholics is like when you fuck with what we do culturally, like we don't feel very respected by that. And that is important. And you can't just say like, oh, the religious guys are getting their knickers in a twist because someone said that they did the sign of the cross wrong. It's like, no, that's actually important for the same reason that like getting any community right is important. But anyway, I just yeah. want to throw that yeah, out Yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah, we're it's talking a fair about point. something yeah. artistically valid here. But anyway, go ahead. Right, 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 right. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. And so, you know, I just assumed this was so much kind of like cultural slop in terms of like representation, which is again, just kind of what you expect. Um, but but by the end of the film when he's Logic. had this like profound like um maturation as a human being like integration of his person um like resolution of this like really complex situation with like um sexy sister incarnacion uh and all of his like failed and real desires to be a father with these orphans and like the whole crisis of all of this um then like after these ter major turning points um he starts making the sign of cross correctly there's a specific moment, in fact, where he he's able for the first time to examine his seemingly opposed, seemingly oppositional desires while putting his selfishness aside. And he's doing so in front of the Blessed Sacrament. He's doing so in a chapel for the first time. He's actually presenting these things to God and asking God, what what do you want me to do about these things? Um, and it's when he he has the revelation that leads to that maturation that you're talking about and this this moment he ends this prayer with the sign of the cross done properly done correctly and it's just yeah. like you know i mean listen maybe it was totally that is the kind of thing i am totally open to being completely random um but like you know um symbolic communities of any kind like um these thick symbolic gestures just like when you're inside of them they communicate really dramatically and so um as somebody who lives like within this symbolic community like that whether it was totally random or not um adds like a powerful strength to this whole dynamic in the film um and makes it like visually and symbolically resonant in a way that like gives the film a, a certain feeling of completeness um which is really cool and so like i am totally my take on these things is i am totally open for this being um intuitive and accident like just a yeah just it's a, no a, less meaningful as an art form to us and this is what i was saying before about how annoying it is when christians like have to make an artwork they like intentionally about jesus in order to justify their liking of it it's so freaking annoying you know it's it it means no less as an art form if this is just stuff we're bringing to it yeah but it but regardless like from looking looking at it from within this from within this thought world like it's actually really effective it really happens that way in the film and it really like um 
that like symbolic movement um with just like his ability to like physically enact the most basic element of like christian worship um moving from like sloppy crappy not really to like at major transitional key moment of like integration and and um and maturation um to like suddenly working for the first time like it's powerful you know in just like a simple easy fun again like profoundly kind of magical realist way um but it works it really works yeah. and like the like the film this is i think like the great strength of the film and why why again it just like totally weirdly consistently weirdly rises above everything that you would expect from this film and from its genre and from, from everything that it is it's just like all those little touches just click like they work yeah i mean on like a representation note uh you know purely on a culture representation note there's a moment where he's he's trying to convince the nun to sort of go on a surreptitious date with him um so he can impress her with his skills and he um he tells her he saw two homeless guys on the street and in any, again, in every Christian Catholic movie, he would say, Oh, like I want to go tell them about Jesus or I want to go tell them about the Bible or whatever. And, and he says, I want to go talk to those guys about the gospel, which is like the most Catholic thing to say. Like that is only yeah, yeah, a yeah, phrase. Yeah, we so there was care actually. Ta- there was some, there was just some care taken to get this right. But, I want to build on the theme of of the the maturation uh, of fatherhood thing because that I do think is very clearly intentional in the film that is like ultimately the point of the film. There is a thing that happens in a lot of movies where a loser becomes a grown up or even a loser becomes a dad both of which are present in the example you brought up with knocked up where that character sort of graduates Peter Pan style and enters into the adult world. But what I really love about Nacho Libre, one of the things I really love about Nacho Libre is this film even subverts that expectation because the adult world that this character is surrounded by is also really immature and governed exclusively by sentimentality. Sister Encarnacion, despite her commitment to her vows and her sincere faith, operates by a faith that's exclusively dictated by sentimentality. When the kids ask her why wrestling is a sin, according to her, she doesn't really know. And she passes the buck over to Ignacio, right? She is that Catholic person, that Christian person, that religious person generally, who, when they feel uncomfortable with something, says it's a sin without necessarily knowing how to cash that check, right? But there are others too. The, the, the wrestlers are wildly insecure. His, his friend, his wrestling partner, uh, El Skeletor, uh, is, is a self-proclaimed atheist who only believes in science and who hates uh, all the orphans that I ever hate lived. hate all the orphans. Yeah. I hate all the orphans that ever lived. Uh, and he is this caricature of like the atheist who is exclusively existing in reaction to faith, right? There's no genuine consideration of the universe. There's no sober sort of reflection upon what he actually believes and what he stands for and his values. It, he just hates, he just hates religion and he just hates, you know, things that seem too sincere and and he is reacting in a purely emotional level and both of these characters despite their pretty radical spiritual differences from ignacio also reach their maturity simply by sort of being risen on the tide that is his maturation process sister encarnacion grows in her faith just by watching ignacio go on this journey um uh, uh, El Skeletor grows in a more mature and thoughtful and refined kind of agnostic atheism uh, as a result of growing in respect for his friend and and seeing his love and and so many other characters do as well. The kids, I mean, the orphans go from you know having this respect for wrestlers who literally do not give a crap about them to ultimately having respect for their father figure in in Ignacio. So. That I really love too. I mean, there's so many subversions, the subversion, the seemingly intentional subversion of the hero's journey thing, where there's so many jokes where you think it's going to become hero's journey. And then they, in some cases, literally crap on it. Um, there's an amazing scene where, you know, he's about to be given eagle powers by a, a sea gypsy 
And then he just like farts and falls off the cliff because they, they want you to know how dumb that moment in the hero's journey would be. And, and then yeah, this, this, is, this is, of, this is, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, I've forgotten it, but there is, there is literally, there's this very important stage in the hero's journey, which is like going on a quest to get a magical item where you are helped by, um, uh, some sort of magical aid, like some, yeah, some, like some, sensei, some sort of ma- a Yoda figure. A Yoda figure comes and he comes and gives you the aid that you need, and usually you bring some some either physical object or some internal realization uh, away with you to the next stage. So it's a kind of little by it's like a by step, you know. And then you go back to the main step of your journey, but now you've been changed because you've been helped by this like sensei Yoda, you know, whatever. Um, I, and and like. And it's incredible because they do actually embark on exactly that. And it's like, it's just like, oh, wow, here it is. Yeah, here's that. It wow. Fails here's that. Miserably. And, and, and it's it, a complete bomb. And it's just, and that's it. And like, you never, there's no, there's no like, when you nudge, nudge, like, haha, we just blew up the hero's journey. But they did. They just right, did. Well, Ignacio, except for the fact that Ignacio is pissed off about it because he is so desperate to see himself as a character in that movie. He is mm. so desperate to see himself as a figure in his own hero's journey story. And when, the eagle egg that he steals and drinks and falls off a cliff trying to steal and drink does not give him the eagle powers. Uh, he's livid. He's really broken down by it. And then that goes nowhere. And I, that I love, there's so many things where it's, it's subverting the expectation of the dumb man child matures trope. It's subverting the expectation of the Catholic priest lust, lusts after a nun trope. It's subverting the hero's journey trope. And it's just, constantly daring you to say oh you th- i mean hell it's subverting the dumb farty kids movie trope right i mean you see this movie open with nickelodeon studios and the green slime you know orange football logo and you're like oh i know what this is going to be and it's just continuously flipping you off and saying no you don't but come closer you yeah, know and i yeah, i think yeah. that's just what good art is Right. Like whether or not you like this film personally, aesthetically, whether or not you take from it what you and I are now spiritually drawing from it, whether or not you agree that the spirituality that we are taking from it is intentional, I think you do have to agree that this film contains that component that makes all great art great art, which is the flipping off of expectation and the the invitation to draw closer to some kind of truth. Yeah, and it's just in the end, like it is a story. Tr- the, like, it is trying to tell a true story about what it means to be a person with love, like speaking from love for like what it means to be a person. I uh, and trying to look at that really truly. Um, and along the way, like it, it sort of intentionally inverts a lot of common false ways of telling that story um but it's just it's it, it's in the end nothing greater or less than um you know an 88 minute film that's trying to tell trying to be honest and that is just it's actually just shockingly rare to have a film that is just really you could say what is the one thing is trying to do well it is just honestly trying to be honest and that's all you can really ask of art that's all we can really ask of ourselves So with that in mind, we encourage you guys and all that you make to strive for that kind of radical honesty. And with that, go forth, create cool things. You've been listening to Created Things, a podcast of Catholic creatives, hosted by Father Gabriel Toretta OP and Jacob Flores Popcheck, produced by Jessica Flores Popcheck and Kyle Meineke. To find out more about how you can support the podcast and other ventures for artists, visit catholiccreatives.org forward slash support.